So for the month of March, this is the one word that you need to learn. Short, simple, three letters, not that complicated. Everyone can say yes. yes. At least in one language. Say again, yes. yes. All right. Are you awake today? Yes. Did you remember it was daylight savings? Yes. You ready to hear from God? Yes. All right. I hope you've already been listening this morning. So yes gets a little more complicated when we think about our topic, our theme, and our next step of holiness unto the Lord, which is, can you say this one with me? Yes, Lord. And yes, Lord, in a total surrender, as we just sang, and all the things that I am and all the things that I have to say to God, yes. Yes, with my whole heart. Yes, with my life. Now, that's a strange word, isn't it? Surrender. Yes is not that hard. But that idea of surrender is pretty strange. To who? To what? Why? I don't know what comes to mind for you when you think about surrender. Maybe a defeated general that is surrendering his sword to the victorious army, giving up. Maybe a politician that is saying, I lost. I surrender this election. Or maybe it's an MMA fighter that's tapping out and says, you win. I surrender. But part of what surrender is, is that I'm saying I'm giving up. I'm giving in. I'm relinquishing my power. And surrender says you win, and surrender also says that you are in control. And I'm not. Definitely part of the Christian life is commitment, amen? That Jesus calls us to commit and go all in with him and stay on this long journey with him through our life. And definitely part of the Christian life is obedience, amen? Another hard word, but Jesus calls us to obey the very word of God with all of our life. But you can might commit to something, even commit to something noble, and kind of still be in control. You might commit to reading the Bible, or you might commit to lose weight, or commit to be a better person. In a similar way, you can obey your boss, or your parents, or even God, and you can do it with gritted teeth. Fine, God, I'll do that if I have to. But surrender is something below all of that, or even more foundational in the Christian life, which says, again, I am not king, but you are. I am not in control, but you are. That's a part of surrender. This is a big word. Maybe it's something that's strange or different to us. They're merely saying yes. But in one real sense, we surrender in everyday circumstances, if you think about it. When I get on an airplane, I surrender to this pilot. I do what he says. I put on my seatbelt. And I'm out of control, and I have to trust that he knows what he's doing and that he is at the control, and he's doing something better than I can do it. And I give him that, and I stop thinking about it, and I try to enjoy the flight. At the hospital, whether it's a nurse at a checkup or I'm under the knife of a surgeon, I give him control. I surrender. I'm not saying, no, no, over there. There's that. No, I, I disagree with your prognosis. I'm surrendering, saying, I think you have the training. I think you have the experience and expertise. I think you know what you're doing, and I don't. This is why we have lawyers. I don't know all of this stuff. Please help me. I'm giving you control of my future, of my legal case, of my very well-being. I take my car to the mechanic, and I know something about bikes or cars, but I surrender control. Is that what you say is wrong with it? Is that how much it really costs? I surrender. It doesn't mean that we stop thinking. It doesn't mean that we lose our opinions. It doesn't mean I turn off my brain. It doesn't mean I don't ask questions. 
but it means I surrender to someone who is above me, who knows more than me. I surrender to their experience again, to their expertise, to their position. And I say to them, you know best here. You know how to lead this. I trust that you do much better controlling this than I possibly can. And in everyday life too, in some sense, a true, loving, intimate relationship with someone is surrender too, isn't it? You're surrendering. Your schedule, your time, your agenda, your self-centeredness, your selfishness, your wants to say, I'm going to lose control because I love you. And that is what Christianity is, isn't it? It's a living, loving relationship with God himself. Isn't that amazing? But Christianity is a loving, living, true relationship with God himself. That's not what he said at all. God said, go to Nineveh. And he said, nah, I'm going to Tarshish. And he said, go and tell these people to repent. And Jonah said, nah, I don't want to have anything to do with that, Lord. God told them, go and tell these people they need to repent because apart from me, without this surrender to me, they will perish. And Jonah said, well, I like that part, the perishing part. But I, I don't want to go and do any of that. God asked him, don't you care, Jonah? And then Jonah's real answer is no, not at all. What if I go and it doesn't work out? What if I go and they don't repent? It doesn't work out for me. Or what if I go and they do repent and that really doesn't work out for me, God? I don't want to surrender to that. I don't want to go. And it's a beautiful story. It's a powerful story because God is sending a prophet of his to go and tell people, surrender, repent, come to worship the one true God. But in the process, he has to tell the messenger of surrender that he needs to surrender himself. So why wouldn't Jonah just say yes to God? He knows God. He knows God spoke to him. It's not really a question of belief. Why try the hard way of trying to do things on our own? Why does it look so appealing to us? And why was Jonah still not saying yes, Lord, even after he was in the belly of a great fish and puked out on a shore? How and why do we do this? What does this mean for our life today? I'm glad you asked. So my opinion doesn't matter much. So let's turn to God's word. Let's start in the right place. Let's take a look at Luke 9. We'll start in verse 18. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowd say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. Verse 21, and he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and the holy angels. 
But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. And then we're going to skip down. But in verse 28, if you have your Bibles open, after this, Jesus has transfigured. And they see the glory of God. They see Jesus, in a sense, his full glory, or a part of it unveiled before them. And then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. Listen to him. And then a boy is healed of a demon, and Jesus talks again of his death. And then in verse 57, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Lord God, as we come to your word today, will you speak to us? Will you change us in this process? Will you help us to respond better to what you reveal to us about who you are, what you do, and what you would have of us, Lord God? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first part of this surrendered life is, is to who? And Jesus tells us, to whom is to him, that we surrender to God. And again, part of the idea of surrender is that we surrender to someone who is in better control, who knows more, who has expertise, has the right position. And that's why if we minimize God or we don't know God or we shrink parts of who he is, it's a way harder to surrender to him. And Jesus asked, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, the Christ of God. You are the Messiah. And before Jesus is talking about picking up crosses or what these costs of following him are going to be, he starts in the right place and says, who do you say that I am? It starts with truth of who God is. I don't know if you've heard these stories about these Japanese soldiers who were scattered all over the Pacific. And when Japan lost the war, even though they surrendered formally, there was these pockets of soldiers that were still left. There was this one guy, he was one of the last to surrender. I think about 29, 30 years later, he was on this small island in the Philippines. But his last command before he got separated was, hey, we might come back in three or five years but don't quit. Keep fighting until we come back for you and your team. But they never came back. And then they dropped leaflets around to say, the war is over. Come out of the jungle. It's finished. But he would pick these up and say, I think it's a lie. They're just trying to get us out. And so for 29 years, this guy is polishing his rifle. He's killing Filipinos that he thinks are soldiers coming after him. But he, he won't believe this truth that the war is finished, and he's stuck. He's stuck to his promise before about what he thinks is his duty and his honor, even though the war is finished. But Jesus starts by asking his disciples, who do you say I am? What's the truth? What's the truth of life? This is the, really the central question of life. We started with this, who is God? Who do I really believe he is? And then what will I do with him? How will I respond? Will I bow? Will I ignore? Will I minimize? Will I reject him? Will I surrender? You know, John the Baptist has been announcing the Messiah has come. 
Disciples have met Jesus and they've said, come and see, this is the one. This is the Messiah. And then Jesus spends time with these people getting to know them. Says things like, come and follow me. Today, I must go to your house. I've come to see you. And then he's been patiently teaching this 12 and a wider circle of people to say, watch what I'm doing. See who I am. Listen to what I say. Look at the testimonies and fact check and add this up and believe who I am. But then you have to make a personal response. Who is Jesus Christ? Who am I? Who do you say that I am? Because it's not going to do for you what the crowd is saying, what your parents say, what you heard pastors say. Well, I grew up hearing this or I heard that. Jesus asks, look at the evidence, look at what you've seen, and then ask, who do you say that I am? That is the central beginning of surrender. We're not surrendering to a moral code. We're not surrendering to an abstract idea or a philosophy or a guru. We're surrendering to the person of God. And if I'm going to surrender, I have to know who he is, have a relationship with him, enter into that. He says, you are the Christ. And then in this great show, Jesus reveals in his transfiguration, and the Father says, listen to him. We've used this phrase often this year to talk about this in our series, that we have to let God be God. He says, I am, who am I? You are the Christ. Well, then will you follow me as the Messiah? Second part of this is that he calls us then to deny ourselves, to be humbled. Christ, I know who you are. And then Christ reveals who we are and what we need to do and why we need to surrender. He said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. The Bible tells us that knowing God is a question of revelation, that he shows us who he is. And then it's a question of response to how I will respond to that. He tells us to surrender, surrender to him. more than just following any ideas or ascribing to any moral truth or rules or any hero worship following jesus is a personal ongoing relationship which requires death and rebirth and what do we mean when we say that we die to ourselves? it means that i give up that control of my life to say i am not best suited to run this show that you are my creator you are my king you deserve to be Lord of my life. And it's a rejection. It's a rejection of my selfish ways and the ways of this world in surrender to the one who created me, the one who's the true Lord, the only one who is holy. He says to deny yourself and take up this cross daily, which means that we have a dedication to God, an obedience to God, that it's ongoing, that it's persistent, that it's daily. That trusting in Jesus' words and not ashamed of them. Surrendering to what he has revealed to us in scripture. You know, you think about what would it be like to hear those words to a first century person that's standing around because the cross is not a metaphor. It's something that they can see dotting the countryside of people who have been strung up. People have been humiliated. People have lost their life. And Jesus tells those people who see real crosses, pick up your cross. Pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Because the key here is that the root of sin, which is the root of all human problems, the root of sin is that I will not surrender. 
Sin is not just simply doing bad things. It's saying, I will not listen to you, God. I won't say yes, Lord, at least not with my heart. I won't say yes, Lord, in all of the ways and all of the things that you have called me to do. I won't surrender. Because at the root of it, I still think I know what is best, at least in this situation, at least for today. And I don't think you understand, God. I know you're Lord. But I don't want the consequences of surrendering those things, at least not now, at least not yet. When Jonah will not listen, it's because he will not surrender. He will not really let God be God. He's still saying, I know what's best for Nineveh. I know what's best for me. I know what's best for Israel. Now, what does this look like in our daily life? He tells them in Luke 9, 57 to 62. Will you turn there with me again? He says what this surrendered life looks like. After this transfiguration, after more miracles, people come to him and say, I will follow you. And if you notice, as we read, there was a lot of buts on the screen. Some from Jesus, some from people. And people bring to him some real world concerns about why I won't fully surrender. Things that aren't evil, things that aren't so bad. And on the surface, especially, don't seem that selfish or self-centered. They don't seem sinful. But let's take a minute and break these down. Verse 57, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And then Jesus gives the first but. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus wasn't turning this man away. He wanted to be clear and explain what is following Jesus. What does it really look like? What are the costs? Do you know what's involved? Do you know this kind of surrender? There's more than just meets the eye. There's more than just following with the crowd. He says, you have to have a personal response to this, and I want you to be clear. And it seems this man has no idea of the cost of following Jesus. Even animals have homes. But do you understand that the Son of Man does not? He doesn't have these comforts because he's moving in urgency in this mission of God. To bring about the kingdom of God on earth and reconciliation between people and God. He tells his friends plainly, following me might have some cost. If people hate me, if my life is trials, what do you think yours will be like? Friday night, we had some newcomers in our small group, and it came apparent that they, they didn't have a Christian background, that they weren't Christians. And as we talked with them and shared about who is Jesus, what is this whole story about, you know, it's, it would be a bit rash for me to quickly say, do you want to come follow Jesus? You just heard about him for about 15 minutes. you want to follow him right now? I mean, in one sense, I don't want to miss any opportunity to give someone the chance to say, yes, Lord. But in another sense, I have to be clear with him and say, I think this might take a little more investigation if you're going to give truly your whole life to him and you're going to surrender. Jesus asked, do you know who I am? And then he tells him, do you know what this will cost to follow me? The kind of surrender that this is. Because Jesus talked to a rich young ruler that called him good and said, I do the things that you want, the things that are commanded. Jesus says, but I know there's a piece of you that's not surrendered. Will you give that up and follow me? And he said, no, I won't. I won't. So why is Jesus talking about foxes, holes, birds, nest? I don't think it can mean that every Christian is going to be homeless or destitute. But it's that we no longer live expecting or looking for comforts in this world. I think a part that I'm surrendering is I'm surrendering desires that captivate me. I'm surrendering a notion of I need all of these things for life to be okay, for life to be good, for me to be accepted, for me to be okay, for me to be comfortable. It's an issue of security, but it's an issue of desire. 
Jesus says, will you surrender those things? May we forever surrender any health and wealth gospel because Jesus' words don't seem to support it. But he says, do you know what this will be? He knows our hearts are connected to our money, that they're connected to our desires, and they're expressed in the things that captivate us, in the things that we spend time thinking we really need. Of course, there's basics of life. God is a God of provision and a God who provides, amen, for all of our needs. But I don't know about you, but I know I have spent an exceeding amount of time thinking about things that I want, planning how I'm going to get them, then trying to hold on to them, and when I look deeper, I see so much of my identity has been wrapped around these things as well, about who I am, how good I feel about myself, how secure I feel. And Jesus says, part of this surrender is to surrender those things, even worry about, is God going to come through? Am I going to have enough? Am I going to be enough? To surrender these things that captivate me. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 is a good good place to look later. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. And then next, let's look at verse 59 and 60. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. There are pressures, there are obligations on our life. In this culture, it's a little hard to tell if this man's father has already died and the, the son needs to attend his funeral and make preparations, which would be culturally sensitive. But it also seems very likely that he's saying, I have an obligation to stay with my family, support them until my father dies. And once those obligations are done, once I am, in a sense, independent, then I'll go and follow you. That could be 10, 15 years down the road. But there are obligations of life that are normal, that are real, that are serious. But have we surrendered these things to God as well? Or does our life feel pressured and buried by wanting to accomplish something or feel of a pressure of what I need to do or what I need to be? before and apart being a disciple of Jesus Christ that has surrendered to him. That Japanese guy, he wouldn't surrender because he had these pressures on him to fulfill what he perceived to be his bound duty. He believed that the emperor was a god. He believed that Japan was fighting, in a way, a holy, serious war, and he would not give up. He was bound to this kind of man-made honor and duty and this obligation that he had, and he wouldn't stop. If we extend this out, what Jesus is saying here about follow me first, follow me now, I know that it's hard to surrender all if our personal aspirations, if all these obligations that we feel, these pressures from society, from culture, from my own sense of duty, my own sense of what I think I need to be, if those crowd into my life goals I want to reach, places I want to go, things I want to see and experience. And then, Jesus, I'll follow you. Then I'll surrender more. Come and follow me, but, but first, God. But I need to take care of this first. But I'm not ready. But, but later. But when I can settle down, but when I have the time to do it, God, after I've taken care of some certain things, when I finally get around to cleaning up my own life, when I could get more discipline, then, then I'll surrender more. And it's kind of ironic and silly, but we say, I'll surrender when I am ready to surrender. Uh, I'll surrender when the time is fitting. Me and my goals and my dreams. And lastly, here he tells us to surrender the relationships that I love. Maybe this is family obligations. He says in verse 61, another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell to those who are at my house. This is a hard one. 
but an important one. I think the right idea of surrender starts with having the right priority of your relationships. You know, in my life, what I try to keep as that chain is I surrender to God first. That my relationship with him is the superior first place in my life. And then it's my wife. And then it's my children. And then it's you. And then it's my friends. But my identity, my chief surrender is to God. And I feel all the time pressure coming on me to get that upside down, to get it inverted. Sometimes I have to say to my wife, remember, it's God first and then our children. And then me. And she has to say the same thing to me, that our first relationship is that. And I notice I'm not surrendering fully when I start to say, but God, first I have to do this with these relationships. Or I need this relationship now, or I won't let this one go. You know, also, that we come to surrender, we have to remember again, who and what we're surrendering to. That Japanese guy stayed in that jungle for 29 years until Japan sent his commanding officer to that island and to that jungle, and then he finally believed. And the guy said, you're relieved. You can let go. You can surrender. This guy went back to Japan, in some ways a hero, and to a whole new world that he didn't know. And he wrote this book called No Surrender, My 30 Years War, about how he wouldn't let go and wouldn't surrender. You know, Jesus himself connects his life to the story of Jonah. He says in a way that he is the ultimate Jonah. And Jonah went to a far off land to tell people, repent, come back to this relationship with God, surrender. And people responded. Jesus Christ came from a very far off land. Two people like us who needed to hear the same message, repent, surrender your life, give up your life, and take on my life. Pick up your cross daily and come and follow me. God says to Jonah towards the end of that book, do you know that there's 120,000 people in Nineveh who don't know up from down, who don't know left from right, right, whose lives are backwards, who need to surrender? I mean, can you imagine that conversation between the father and the son? You know, there are billions of people, and there'll be billions more who are living unsurrendered lives, who are rejecting, who are ignoring, who are dead and dying. Will you go? And quite unlike Jonah, Jesus' answer is, thy will be done. The message of Jesus is that he surrendered his will to that of the fathers to bring him glory, that we would be saved. People who are unrighteous, unholy, people who would not surrender. Jesus is not our example of surrender only. He's not just a teacher of surrender, but it's his surrender that makes it possible at all that we enter this relationship with God himself. And we must too surrender to accept this. We must bow. We must let go of our throne and say, here, Lord, here's my whole life. Yes, Lord, I'll give you control. Yes, Lord, I'll go wherever you go. And as we do this, I think important thing to remember as we surrender is that Jesus is a holy, righteous God who came to us because we are unholy and unrighteous people. Because my heart default is I don't want to surrender to anyone except myself and what I want. And he is a holy and righteous God that has every right to judge us. He has every right to be in control. But brothers and sisters, I encourage you to think about when you surrender, if you only think of God as a holy, righteous, apart from us taskmaster, you might surrender in some kind of obedience with gritted teeth out of fear. But we have to hold together also that this God, this holy God, came to us because he loves us. 
He surrendered because God so loved the world. That God so loved the world that didn't deserve it. Though he knew my heart, he knew ways that no one else knows about me, ways I won't surrender. And yet he would die for me. So we hold together those two things, that he is righteous, he is holy, and that he would love me that way. That's why we sing how marvelous, how wonderful, that that's what starts to captivate me, that I don't want to look back with the plow, but look towards his kingdom to say, this is the one who would die for me. And if I surrender my life to anything else, it will fail me. It will enslave me. Or it will come up short and I'll keep looking for another one. That Jesus Christ is the only Lord, the only King, the only Master. That if I surrender to him, there is peace and there is flourishing and there is joy and there is life. We're going to close with a time of ministry here and a time for us to surrender. And I want to bring up what we started with. That we say yes to God. Can you say yes again? All right, not so hard right now. The hard part, yes, Lord. Okay. To me, these three simple questions have helped me surrender to God to respond to him. It's something I learned actually very simply from a counseling course and something I use in Christian counseling, but something that is I use in discipleship, especially my own. And it starts like this, Lord, what are you doing? And any situation that I come across, Lord, what are you doing? In other words, how are you being God? How are you being God? What are you saying? What are you revealing? What do you want me to do? That word came to Jonah, didn't it? And he should have been asking, Lord, what are you doing? Why do you want to save these people? What does this say about you? Why are you sending me? What do you really want me to do? And in any situation, you know, people come to me and say, can you change my child or can you change my husband? Or you don't understand, my boss is like this and they make me do that and I have to slow everyone down just like myself and say, take a breath and think for a second, what is God doing here? Stop blaming people and say, what does God want you to learn? What is God teaching you? What is God saying to you? And the second question there then is, how am I responding to that, to what God is saying, to what God is doing, to what God wants me to do? How am I responding to that? And that comes up with a couple things. Am I I rejecting him? Am I minimizing him? Am I ignoring him? How am I responding? Sorry, we have a font problem. How am I responding to him? Jonah, again, how does he respond? He rejects him. He runs the other way. He clearly hears what God wants, but it's his response. He won't bow. He won't surrender. And the last one is, how could I respond better? To be honest, how am I actually responding to these situations in my life that God wants me to grow, God wants me to change, God wants me to surrender? Then how could I respond better? Am I letting God be God? What part of my life is he calling me to surrender to? Am I being humbled? And all of these situations, no matter what obstacle, no matter what pressure comes in your life, you ask yourself these questions. You know, my wife and I have been praying about some big decisions in our life for quite a while. And oftentimes we ask, what are you, what are you doing, God? What are you saying? But usually it comes out like this. God, why didn't this happen yet? God, why didn't you answer? God, why are those doors closed? God, why isn't it the way I want it to be? And oftentimes, praise God, I have a wife that will say, Kyle, What does God want us to change? What is he saying to us? What is he trying to teach us? Is there anything that we're not responding rightly? Is there anything we're not doing? What is he trying to tell us in this situation about him and about what kind of God he is? And then second, how we respond to that. What should we do? Should we be more patient? Should we be more loving? 
Are there things that we need to surrender? Are there things that we need to repent of? And that's how we answer that last question. How could I respond better? How can I let God be God? So I invite you to spend some time. Our worship team is going to come up and lead us. And I invite you to, to spend a moment asking God where you need to surrender in your life. What parts of it are you saying, but Lord, when we should be saying, yes, Lord?